Hello everyone, I'm the Dungeon Doctor. Welcome to the latest video in the Monk Masterclass series. This time we're going to be looking at the way of Astral Self Monk, the subclass which grabs you with two hands, slaps you with the other two and shouts, yes, this is a JoJo's reference. This is undoubtedly why it has proven a popular subclass choice since its introduction in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It also brings something unique to the Monk class, allowing characters to utilize their wisdom stat for their unarmed strikes, so they can go aura, 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 all over their enemies. But for me, that's actually something I find boring about the subclass. That's right, Jojo fans, I said it! Your subclass is boring! Oh my god! We've been able to do that since the player's handbook by just picking up Shillelagh from a feat or multi-classing. It was only by digging deep into the mechanics of the subclass I was able to pull something truly special out of it. But before I can share what I found, let's review the subclass features. At level 3 we gain one feature, but it's a big one. Arms of the Astral Self. As a bonus action, we can spend one key point to summon the arms of our Astral Self. When we summon our arms, any creature of our choice which we can see within 10 feet of us must make a dexterity saving throw or take force damage equal to two rows of our martial arts die. It's like a sudden flurry of punches to the enemies around us, giving us a small blast of damage. It's not very powerful and the creatures don't take damage if they succeed on the save. But it doesn't cause friendly fire and it's a bonus action so we can potentially use it in combination with our action to pull off some interesting tricks. Once we've summoned our arms they remain for 10 minutes or until we're incapacitated or until we die? It's funny that the rules needed to specify both incapacitated and dead. I like the rules to be clear, but I don't think anyone would argue that their dead character isn't also incapacitated. <sighs> While the arms are present, we have the following benefits. We can use our Wisdom modifier in place of our Strength modifier when we make Strength checks or saving throws. We can use the arms to make unarmed strikes. When we make an unarmed strike with the Spectral arms on our turn, our reach is 5 feet greater than normal. And we can use our Wisdom modifier for the Unarmed Strikes, as opposed to Strength or Dexterity, for both the attack and damage rows. The damage they deal is Force Damage. 10 minute duration is nice, potentially we could summon the arms before a combat breaks out, although if we do that we'd lose the benefit of that initial blast of damage. 10 minutes should last for 1 or 2 combats, but if we drop to 0 hit points, or are affected by certain conditions that cause us to be incapacitated, like stunned, paralysed, dead, then the arms disappear. As I said earlier, the ability to attack with our wisdom modifier is nice, but not special. The force damage is good, as with it we can get around resistance to physical forms of damage from a very low level. And the 10 foot reach is nice. Having more reach really lets a monk lean into the hit and run playstyle, which the monk seems to advertise. Sadly, the extra reach only exists on our turn, so we can't use the extra reach to trigger an opportunity attack. <sighs> Rose desires, why do you hate monks so much? It'd be simpler to give them the 10 foot reach while they have the astral arms than to make this weird on your turn exception. Seriously, they're doing this with the rogue class in 1D&D &D as well. They're trying to make it so you can only sneak attack on your turn and then not out of turn using ambushes or opportunity attacks, it's just... Why? 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 So far nothing too special, but I haven't talked about the most unique feature, being able to replace our strength modifier with our wisdom for strength checks and saving throws. It doesn't sound like much, but it's actually the only unique part of this subclass for me. With this, a character can have a single stat which makes them both a great spellcaster and greater grappling creatures. Colby at D4 Deep Dive just recently released a kind of grappling combined with spellcaster build, just coincidentally released it at the same time as I was recording and scripting this, and in that he actually goes through that same struggle of not being able to maintain a high spellcasting stat while being a good grappler, so it's interesting that this build is going to kind of complement that. At level 6 we gain the Visage of the Astral Self, which is like a mask or helmet over our face. Alternatively, we can spend two key points under our bonus action to summon both the Visage and the Astral Arms. Like the arms, it lasts for 10 minutes and ends when we're incapacitated or dead. While the visage is present, we gain three benefits. With Astral Sight, we can see normally in darkness, both magical or non-magical, up to 120 feet. Hmm. That seems weirdly familiar. 
Warlock, Shadow Sorcerer, I finally done it. I can see through magical darkness, just like you. Good, good. Better late than never at level 6, but never mind. Now, cast the darkness spell and dominate your enemies. Ah, see, I don't have the darkness spell, but maybe one of you could cast it for me. You get how this works, right? First you get Devil's Sight. Oh, you mean Astral Sight. Excuse me? Astral Sight. You can see normally in darkness, magical and non-magical, non up to a distance of 120 feet. feet. Yes, yes, yes. But tell me, with Astral Sight, are you seeing into the astral plane? Well, no, but... Are you seeing a creature's true self? Their very soul? No. And apart from the word astral, is there any difference in the wording between this and Devil's Sight? No. So, as I was saying, you get Devil's Sight, and then cast the Darkness spell to create magical darkness which you can see through. Can you cast the Darkness spell for me? I mean, I could, but Darkness is a second level spell, and I've got third level spell slots now. Darkness and Devil's Sight were so last tier. But what about... I'm with Warlock on this. I'm concentrating on Hypnotic Pattern and Twinned Haste. If you want darkness so much, go multi-class or reincarnate yourself as a drow. When we have the Astral Visage active, we also gain Wisdom of the Spirit. With this, we gain advantage on Wisdom Insight checks and Charisma Intimidation checks. And with Word of the Spirit, we gain the ability to speak to creatures of our choice within a range of 60 feet, so only they can hear us. Alternatively, we can amplify our voice, so all creatures within 600 feet can hear us. Wisdom of the Spirit gives the monk more they can do in social situations, which has always been a huge weakness of the monk class in my opinion. Meanwhile, Word of the Spirit could be circumstantially useful in stealth operations for communicating privately during social or combat situations, and unlike spells like Message, it doesn't take an action. Personally, I'd probably use this to over-explain my overly complicated plans to the enemies as we fight them, in true honoured shonen anime fashion. Behold, my stand is more powerful than any other. With Indigada Davida's stunning strike, I can freeze time around you for exactly six seconds. Face it, Tiamat, this battle is over. At level 11, we gain Body of the Astral Self. When we summon both the Visage and our arms at the same time, we gain two additional benefits. Deflect Energy allows us to, as a reaction, reduce elemental damage we take, including Acid, Code, Fire, Force, Lightning, or Thunder damage. The damage reduction is equal to 1d10 plus our Wisdom modifier. Is that it? The damage reduction of this is tiny for the level we're at, an average of about 10 damage reduction when Cone of Code deals 36 damage. It just feels unimpressive. With Deflect Missiles, we get to add our Monk level to the damage reduction, so at this level that feature would reduce damage from a weapon by about 20 points which is much more useful and relevant. It feels like the rules designers just forgot to add the scaling to the ability. At least, let's add our proficiency bonus to the reduction too. <sighs> the other benefit we get is Empowered Arms, which once per turn allows us to add an additional martial arts die to the damage rolls of our Astral Arms. This gives our Astral Arms a small boost to damage, and I'm not going to argue about having an extra d8 of damage, but <sighs> it just feels underwhelming and safe. What about an extra attack, or greater reach, or something? Why are these features so safe? At level 17 we gain the feature Awakened Astral Self. Now as a bonus action we can summon our Awakened Astral Self, for the cost of 5 key points. The rules don't state it explicitly, but it looks like we would still gain the blast effect from our Arms of the Astral Self when we use this bonus action, so we still get to make that small burst of damage when we use this feature. When we summon the Awakened Astral Self, we gain a plus two bonus to armor class. Additionally, when we use our attack action for extra attack, we can make three attacks, provided all the attacks are with our Astral Arms. With the amount of key we have at this level, we can afford the five key costs. However, for a 17th level feature, perhaps it could have been made a bit more... dramatic? Heck, 
This could have been the 11th level feature and it would have felt balanced. A plus 2 bonus to armor class isn't going to feel very game breaking at this level of play, and while the additional attack is nice, it doesn't really add much to our overall damage since we can't really do much to improve the damage of our unarmed strikes. The Drunken Master's Intoxicated Frenzy lets them attack 3 extra times with their flurry of blows at this level, at no extra cost. It needs to be on multiple enemies, but still, it's not a good look when that ability makes yours look underwhelming. And we should note, at level 18 the monk gains the Astral Projection spell. The subclass should have involved that feature in some way. It's got Astral in the name! Why won't you use that in some way? Maybe it could have allowed you to control both your astral self and body at the same time? Like some kind of monk simulacrum? <sighs> Sorry if this subclass of fears felt like a bit of a downer, but honestly, the whole subclass feels less like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and more like JoJo's safe and predictable holiday special. It's just so little that I would call unique or disruptive about this subclass with the exception of one part of the third level feature. I can see how Astral Monk can make a great straight classed monk, I really do, as it really helps monks do what they usually do better by just focusing on wisdom, but it's not bringing anything really fun. As I've been making builds for the monk subclasses, I've realised that the best monk subclass features aren't necessarily the strongest ones, but the most unique ones. Features like the Long Death Monk's Hour of Reaping and Mastery of Death, the Kensei Monk's Agile Parry, even the Sun Soul Monk's Radiant Sunbolt, each of these gave something different to the monk which the other classes in the game didn't have access to, and it's those features that allow us to create such unique builds on this channel. Before I get into the build, I once again want to thank you all for the love and support I've been getting on my videos so far. It's really meant the world to me, and in every video I want to get just that little bit better, and maybe a bit funnier too. As interesting as I find optimising characters for D&D, I do realise at times it needs just that little bit of fun added. So please do continue to like, subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, as well as what monk subclasses you'd like me to cover next. Thanks for well, enough talk, it's time to show you the true power of my stand. I present the Way of the Eco Warrior. We're going to build around using our Wisdom modifier for strength checks, allowing us to create a spellcaster who can utilise grapples and melee attacks as part of their repertoire. Because the spellcasting stat is Wisdom, we're limited to combining this class really with Druid or Cleric. I suppose Ranger is also an option, but the spell progression on them is really slow as they are just a half caster. Cleric has a few good spells going for them, like Bane and Spirit Guardians, but the Druid spell list has a much better synergy with a grappling build, and a certain subclass in particular complements Astral Self really well. Because of this, the build is going to have a lot in common with our other Monk Druid multi-class, the Way of the Avatar build, but it's going to feel very different from that build because of the way it utilises grappling in combination with control. And where that one focused on using the four elements of water, earth, fire and air, this build is all about utilising plants to do our bidding. My best video to date was heavily inspired by Harley Quinn, so I really wanted to do a build for her partner in crime, Poison Ivy, at some point. But if you want to stick with the Jojo theme, we could say our stand is inspired by Poison Ivy, because let's face it, the stand mechanic is very plot convenient. Races and ability scores. When we choose our race, we need to consider that they're two feats that would be really useful on this build, so it really makes picking up Variant Human our best option. These feats are Shadow Touched and Skill Expert. Shadow Touched is going to give us access to the Invisibility spell and a first level spell from the Necromancy or Divination spell list, and it lets us cast each of them once per day for free and also using our spell slots. Invisibility is a great and useful spell to have, but there's an often overlooked spell I'm here for. Cause Fear. Cause Fear allows us to make one creature within 60 feet of us become frightened of us if they fail a wisdom saving throw, and they can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of their turns. 
For this build, there are two useful benefits for us. Frightened creatures can't approach our character, which means we can make the most of our increased reach with our arms of the astral self. We can literally keep the enemy at arm's reach. Frightened creatures also have disadvantage on their ability checks, which means we'll have better odds of being able to grapple, trip or shove creatures who are frightened of us. Lastly, Core Sphere has some pretty good scaling, targeting an additional creature for each additional spell level it's cast at, although those creatures do need to be within 30 feet of each other when we cast the spell. There are a couple of drawbacks to this spell. It fails against constructs and undead. I kind of like this flavour in a way. I like to imagine our eco warriors using plant based poisons and pheromones to incite fear in creatures, so it makes sense that robots or undead are our Achilles heel. It's also a shame that creatures can repeat the save at the end of each of their turns, however, it's a wisdom saving throw, which is going to complement the saving throws via other control effects. I'm pretty sure picking up Cause Fear through Shadow Touched is the only way to make creatures frightened of us using a spell save based on our wisdom modifier at reasonably low levels. And because of how it complements the build, it's a very useful feat for us to pick up. Meanwhile, Skill Expert is an obvious pickup, as it's going to allow us to get expertise in athletics so we can make the most of our grappling. However, because we won't be gaining the Arms of the Astral sub feature until we have three levels in Monk, we aren't going to be using grappling much initially. Because of this, we're going to pick up Shadow Touched at first level and Skill Expert with our first ability score increase. If we don't want to go with Variant Human on this build, then I would recommend forgoing Shadow Touched entirely and only picking up Skill Expert with our first ability score increase. There are a lot of good race choices, but the obvious standout is Bugbear. Their reach with their attacks is increased by 5 feet, which means that their total reach it, that they'd have with Arms of the Astral Self is 15 feet. That's pretty long, and it's fun to imagine a character reaching across the room to slap your city. If we go with the point by method and choose either Variant Human as our race, or a race that lets us put a plus 2 in Wisdom and a plus 1 in Dexterity, we can get the following ability score. An 8 in Strength. We're dumping this, as we're able to use our Wisdom modifier for strength checks using Astral Arms. A 15 in Dexterity, which will add a plus 1 2 from our race. A 14 in Constitution. A 15 in Wisdom, which will add a plus 2 from our Shadow Touched feet and our race. Or if we haven't gone for Variant Human, we'll put our plus 2 from our race into this as well. An 8 in Intelligence. And let's put our remaining points into Charisma to make it a 10. If you don't want to be as min-maxed as I am in this build, we can probably afford to drop some points in Dexterity to boost our other modifiers, but it will lower our armor class. Still, if you wanted to lean into a more femme fatale personality of like a traditional Poison Ivy by boosting our charisma, then it's a good option. Personally, I like the modern misanthropic portrayal of Ivy a bit better, even if Uma Thurman in the Batman and Robin film did awaken things in me as a teenager. <sighs> oh, hmm, sorry. Lastly, let's consider what skills we'll pick up from our race and background. We might want to pick up athletics now, but we can grab it later with our half feet skilled expert. I would certainly want to get both insight and intimidation now though, as these will work really well later with Visage of the Astral Self. And as always, stealth and perception are very useful picks on a monk. Level 1. Monk 1. For level 1 we're going to take a level in Monk, giving us Martial Arts and Unarmored Defense. As always, we gain Martial Arts, giving us the ability to make an Unarmed Strike with our bonus action, which will be useful with our Astral Arms later. We also gain Unarmored Defense, letting us start out with a respectable 16 in our Arm class. The main reason I wanted to start with Monk though, is for the saving throw proficiencies in Strength and Dexterity. The proficiency in Strength saving throws is actually going to come in handy as we level up. But if you prefer to have wisdom saving throw proficiencies, then feel free to swap this level and the next level around as we get into level 2, Monk 1, Druid 1. At level 2 we pick up a level in Druid, giving us access to Druid spellcasting. For our cantrips we definitely want to pick up Shillelagh, as this will allow us to use our wisdom for our melee attack stat if we run out of key and can't use Alms of the Astral Self for our attack. Because that's actually a really big problem with the Astral Self Monk. If we lose our Astral Arms and are out of our key, then we're in big trouble because we likely have really invested in Wisdom rather than our Dexterity. 
For our second cantrip, I would probably grab Thorn Whip, as this is another wisdom based attack with some forced movement options, which can come in handy for moving enemies about. We can also at this level prepare up to 4 level 1 spells from the druid spell list. The most powerful spell we have available to us though is Entangle. With Entangle we can summon a 20 by 20 foot area of plants and vines to restrain creatures which fail a strength saving throw. Ah yes, vines. The vegan cousin of the tentacle. Much like the Cause Fear spell, Entangle gives us another way of keeping enemies just out of arm's reach. But unlike that, Entangle can potentially hit multiple creatures and it requires an action for a creature to get out of it. On the other hand, Entangle can cause friendly fire as it affects a large area. It also targets strength rather than wisdom, so if the creature we're facing is physically strong, then we should probably use Cause Fear instead. For other druid spells, consider picking up a healing spell like Healing Word or Goodberry. Also consider the jump spell, because of how it can combine with Step of the Wind for some crazy jump distances. We'll talk more about this one later. I'd also consider picking up Earth Tremor, which can create difficult terrain. This works really well on monks because it lets them make the most of their mobility and use it as an advantage over their enemies. And Thunderwave is a great option for some more forced movement options. And lastly, if we're going for a more charming version of Poison Ivy, we could pick up Charm Person. There are a ton of great first level spells to choose from. Thankfully, we can prepare different spells every long rest, so we can try them out and just see what works for us. Level 3, Monk 2, Druid 1. We're going to be focusing on monk levels for a while. There's actually going to be a lot of overlap with the way of the avatar build I did, so consider checking that out for more insights. But to keep it brief, we can use features like Step of the Wind and Patient Defense to help keep us out of danger and focus on maintaining our concentration on control spells. The only thing I would add is that the mobility buffs for a monk really benefit the cause fear spell as it means we can be more flexible in positioning ourselves when we restrict where a creature can move. Level 4, Monk 3, Druid 1. At level 3 monk we gain our subclass and the Astral Arms feature. On this build I envisage our Astral Arms instead being a series of vines we summon to whip and grapple unfortunate creatures with. That's right, more vines! <laughs> when our vine arms are summoned, we can use our wisdom modifier for attack rows, grappling and our strength saving throws. Because we have a high wisdom modifier and proficiency in strength saving throws, then we have a good chance of making a saving throw against something like our own entangle spell if we happen to be in the area of effect. Straw arms can also potentially improve our jumping. Technically we don't make a strength check for jumping unless the DM rules we need to jump higher or clear an obstacle. However, for me this implies that we would be able to use our wisdom modifier and potentially our wisdom score in place of our strength for rules pertaining to jumping. In which case we could potentially pull off the tricks we've used before, where we combine the jump spell with step of the wind and a high strength modifier to jump further and higher than other creatures. This will probably require discussion with your DM, but let me know in the comments below how you might rule us. Let's talk a bit more about the blast of damage we get from summoning the arms of the astral self. It's pretty weak and does nothing if a creature makes their saving throw. However, it can make a nice combo with the entangle spell. With entangle, we can restrain a group of enemies. This will then give them disadvantage on their dexterity saving throws. We can then follow up by summoning our arms of the astral self against that group of enemies on the same turn, and the restrained condition will then make it more likely that they will fail that saving throw and take that additional damage. Or we can potentially combine two blast effects on the same turn if we use Earth Tremor or Thunder Wave as our action in combination with Arms of the Astral Self for our bonus action. This could be pretty useful if we've got a group of bunched up enemies they are just asking for a lot of area of effect damage. Lastly, our reach with our fine arms is at least 10 feet, so once we've restrained or frightened creatures we're free to pound on while outside their reach. Oh, you're approaching me? Well you would if I wasn't restrained or scared of you! Outside of our subclass we get deflect missiles. I spent a long, long time discussing how we could get more out of this in the Kensei Monk build. Seriously, it was about 5 minutes. So check out that video to hear more about that feature. Because we're trying to keep enemies out of melee reach though, it's worth noting that there's a good chance we'll get to use our reaction to reduce the damage from missile attacks. 
If we can reduce the damage to zero, then we can completely avoid needing to make a concentration check on one of our spells, so it's a good feature to have. Level 5, Monk 4, Druid 1. At level 5 we're going to pick up Skill Expert and use the plus 1 we gain from it to boost our Wisdom to 18. With this we can gain expertise in Athletics, making our grapples very reliable. Not only this, if an enemy is in an area of difficult terrain, such as due to the Entangle spell or Earth Tremor, then we may want to use our Athletics to knock them prone. This way the creature will then need to use 15 feet of movement to get up from prone, and their remaining movement to move out of the area of the difficult terrain. We also gain slow fall, which can work really well if we are able to achieve high jumping distances. Level 6, Monk 5, Druid 1. Monk 5 we gain extra attack and stunning strike. Extra attack is great, as now we can pull off a grapple and trip combo to hold creatures prone before following it up with flurry of blows. Stunning Strike, meanwhile, is more reliable on this build thanks to our High Wisdom modifier. It also combines well with Entangle, as stunned creatures automatically fail their strength saving throws. So on turn 1 we can stun a creature, and on turn 2 use Entangle without fail. Having reached this level of Monk, we've now gained a lot in the way of both control and damage dealing abilities. Entangle, Stunning Strike and Cause Fear each rely on a different saving throw, so we can control all kinds of creatures. Before we grab more levels in Monk, however, we're going to bounce back to Druid. Level 7, Monk 5, Druid 2. With a second level in Druid, we get to pick our subclass, and we're going to go for the often overlooked Circle of the Land. With this we gain an additional Druid cantrip and a list of spells we always know, depending on the land we're associated with. For this character, we're going to go with the Swamp Druid which is actually appropriate for a character that specialises in vines, and it's going to give us some spells which work fantastically on this build. Additionally, once per day, after a short rest, we can recover one of our spell slots. This is a nice perk about the Land Druid, as with it we can now cast up to four first level spells a day, and we're getting a lot of value out of those spell slots. For the free cantrip, I think we should grab Magic Stone. We can combine this with extra attack to make two wisdom based attacks a turn from as far as 60 foot away. Meanwhile we also gain wild shape. We'll probably just use wild shape for infiltration or expiration, but keep in mind that our astral arms will work while we're in animal form. You thought you were petting a Tibetan dwarf hamster. It was me, monk! Because our grappling is based on our wisdom, we can reliably grapple and move creatures while in wild shape. And if we need to move a huge creature, then we can do so while we are a large creature. Also, if we were to take the form of a wolf, then we could take advantage of pack tactics to gain advantage on our unarmed strikes. The hit points of our wild shaped creatures is quite low, but we can consider them as just extra hit points on top of our usual ones. And whatever shape we take, we'll have this great visual of vines bursting out of them Akira style and slapping creatures around. If we're using the optional class features from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we could also use our wild shape to summon a familiar. This is again great for utility and can give characters the help action in combat. And unlike the way of the furry build, we're not going to eat our familiar this time. Probably. Level 8, Monk 5, Druid 3. Now we've reached level 3 in Land Druid, we get our circle spells. These spells currently include Darkness and Melf's Acid Arrow. As we saw from the skit earlier, Darkness can help us make the most of the Fissage of the Astral Self when we gain it. Meanwhile, Melf's Acid Arrow is not a fantastic spell, but it can occasionally be useful when we're facing creatures who are out of our reach. It's also good against spellcasters as it deals secondary damage at the end of the creature's next turn, so it can cause additional concentration checks. Druid also has access to other fantastic spells that work really well with our ability to grapple. Spike growth deals damage to creatures which move through its area, and the area is difficult terrain. So if we have grappled a creature with our vines, on our turn we can cast spike growth with our free hand and then pull them across the spike growth area. For Every square we pass them over, they take 2d4 piercing damage. Currently we have 45 foot of movement, which we can double using Step of the Wind. Grappling halves our movement, so in total we'll be able to move a large or smaller creature through 9 sets of 2d4 damage. 18d4 damage gives us an average of 45 damage, which we can repeat turn over turn. I think this is a useful trick if we can use it after we have grappled and knocked a creature prone. If spike growth isn't convenient because the area is too big and would affect our allies, we could instead cast Moonbeam. 
With Moonbeam, we can trigger the damage when a creature enters the area on a turn. This means we can cast Moonbeam and then drag them into the area of effect, delivering up to 2d10 damage on our turn and a further 2d10 on the start of their next turn. If we still have them grappled on our next turn, we can repeat the process by moving them out of the area and back into it. Also, we have two hands, so in some cases it will be possible to grapple two creatures and move them both through the moonbeam or an area of spike growth on any given turn. This mechanic of combining grappling with spell effects is now complete and over the next few levels it's just going to get better and better. Level 9, Monk 6, Druid 3. Now that we've gained access to the darkness spell, let's grab another level of monk. This means we're able to combine the magical darkness of the darkness spell with our astral visage, mimicking the devil sight magical darkness combo warlocks are well known for. This means if a creature lacks something like blind sight or true sight, it will have disadvantage to attack us and our attacks against it will have advantage while we're in the area of darkness. We'll need to take care that we aren't inconveniencing other characters with a combo, but as our speed is 45 feet, the area of darkness has a radius of 15 feet, and our reach is 10 feet, we should be able to hit and run enemies, leaving them at the end of our turn outside of the darkness, allowing other players to make the most of their turns. Also, the Astral Fissage gives us advantage on Intimidation and Insight Checks, which we should have proficiency in from our earlier skill choices. Level 10, Monk 6, Druid 4. We're going to take a break from Monk now. Druid 4 gives us another ability score increase, which we can use to take our Wisdom to 20. We also gain access to CR Half monsters with Wild Shape, and they can take Swimming Forms, which is useful for exploration, or for being an octopus, if we want to have both tentacles and vines? Level 11. Monk 6, Druid 5. At Druid 5 we gain 3rd level spells, and we gain access to an often overlooked spell through our circle spells, Stinking Cloud. Stinking Cloud creates a 20 foot radius sphere of stinking gas. Creatures who fail a constitution saving throw at the start of their turn while completely in the cloud lose their action, but can otherwise still move. In a way this is like an area of effect version of Stunning Strike. Usually the spell is only available to bards, sorcerers, and wizards, but unlike these classes, we have a built-in way to prevent creatures from moving out of the area while maintaining our concentration. If we have grappled a creature, their movement is zero, so if they then fail this saving throw against Stinking Cloud, they can't use their action to escape the grapple and they also can't move. We can also use our own mobility to move in and out of the Stinking Cloud to attack, grapple or maybe use Stunning Strike on creatures. Provided we don't start our turn in the Stinking Cloud, we don't need to make a saving throw against it. And the area of the cloud is heavily obscured, so we won't take opportunity attacks from creatures while we do this. The synergy of the spell with our build is amazing, it can't be understated. Level 12, Monk 6, Druid 6. The last level of this build we're going to take another level in Druid, and this gives us the usually quite weak feature Landstride. This ability gives us advantage on saving throws against effects caused by magical plants. This is a really niche ability, but we're actually able to take full advantage of it on this build. I mentioned before how we can use our Wisdom modifier for our strength saving throws. This meant we would have reasonable odds of making a saving throw against our own Entangle spell. Well, now we have advantage on that same save. Because both our spell save DC and saving throw depend on our Wisdom, we'll need to roll an 8 or higher to make a save against our own spell. Because we're rolling with advantage though, we'll have about an 80% chance of making this saving throw. So if we do find ourselves surrounded by creatures, we have a useful trick to restrain them with only a low risk of affecting ourselves. In a way, this build is finding ways to optimize the land druid just as much as the way of the astral self. Beyond level 12. Beyond level 12, I think we're best served by taking more levels in Druid and Monk. If we take Druid to level 8, we get access to flying creatures as a wild shape option. Because of the astral arms, we can potentially use a flying form to make flyby attacks using our vines. And we can use our great grapple skills to pick up and drop creatures around the battlefield. And because at this level of Druid, we'd have access to large creatures like giant eagle or direwolves, we should be able to grapple huge creatures reliably. I'd also really want to reach level 10 in Monk as soon as possible. This would give us access to the Purity of Body feature. 
This would give us immunity to poison, which is usually a pretty circumstantial ability. However, for this build, it would mean we could remain within our own stinking cloud, meaning we can happily grapple creatures deep within the area effect and just hold them there. Weirdly, that druid gets the exact same ability at level 10, so if we take this character to level 20, I think we'd want to end with either 8 levels in monk and 12 in druid, or vice versa, as if we go for a perfect 50-50 split of the two, we'll be doubling up on that 10th level feature. Another option is maybe after gaining 6 levels in druid, we would invest the rest of our levels just in monk. This would then mean at uh, level 20 we'd end the campaign with something like Diamond Soul as a feature, but I'd probably only do that if we were having like a level 21 shot or something like that. For our remaining ability score increases, I would prioritise boosting our constitution and dexterity, maybe grabbing resilient constitution or wallcaster as until now we haven't invested in ways to maintain our concentration. This concludes the build, and I really like how this came out. The number of synergies between the Astral Self Monk and the Land Druid is just amazing, and I think for anyone who's looking to create a Druid style Gish, this is a fantastic option to take. The combination of a Druid's control effects with the wisdom based grappling of an Astral Monk lends itself to a really unique and interesting take on both characters. So, thank you for sticking with the build this long. If you have, I Really appreciate all the views, comments, likes, and subscribes that I've been getting. I've been the Dungeon Doctor, and I look forward to seeing you on the next build. It's to modify it in place of our strength, and potentially our wisdom score too. Yeah, things okay. I'm just recording something in the office, trying to pause my thing. Uh, with Ingada, with In, with Ingada, with Inga, Indagada. Yeah. We can summon a spectral visage of our astral self, which is like a mask or helmet over our face. It's gonna look very strange when my frogging just simply jumps mid cut, and I have still got it wrong. Ah! Five hours later. I really need to do that video for the suit costume. It is a glorious costume. Okay. At level six, we gain 